Alright, hello everybody, and today we're going to be having a look at how we can analytically continue the definition of our Riemann zeta function to the whole right half of the complex plane. So our zeta function is defined as this infinite sum right here, um, and this sum actually converges only for the real part of S being greater than 1. And anything less than 1, this sum will diverge, and therefore our zeta function isn't defined for the real part of s less than 1. And I guess the classic case of this is if you set s equals to 1. So if you have zeta of 1, you're actually going to get 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3. And this is actually just the harmonic series which diverges. So we want to come up with kind of another definition for our Riemann zeta function. That's basically this thing right here which converges for the real part of s greater than 1, but also converges for the real part of s greater than 0. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use another function, namely the Dirichlet eta function, which I've talked about in a previous video. So the Dirichlet eta function, it is exactly the sum running from k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the k minus 1 over k to the s. That's the Dirichlet eta function right there. And you can see that these two functions um, in these sum representations right here look quite similar, except the eta function is just an alternating zeta function. And this function is really quite nice because it converges for the real part of s being greater than zero. And I'm not going to prove the um, convergence for, of this function in this video. I think you have to use the Dirichlet test for convergence or something like that. But uh, yeah, we'll just take for granted that this function converges for the real part of s being greater than zero for this video. So we have both of these functions now. And remember, our goal is to come up with another definition for our Riemann zeta function. So why not try to kind of combine these two functions a little bit? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to be splitting both of these sums up into two separate sums. Because notice our index right here is running from one all the way up to infinity. So we're hitting all the natural numbers. So why not split this sum up into the sum involving all the odd k's and all the sum involving the even k's. So if we do that, we're going to get the sum running from k equals one to infinity. And let's start with the odd k's first. So we're going to have one over and if our k is starting from 1 and we want to start at 1, then in order for this k to be odd, we want 2k minus 1 like so. So if you plug k equals 1 into here, you're going to get 2 times 1, which is 2, minus 1, which is 1. So this inside here is 1, and if you increase this to 2, you're going to get 2 times 2, which is 4 minus 1, which is 3. And you see the inside of this bracket right here will always be an odd number. So our k, we've kind of decomposed it into the odd terms so we'll have this thing to the s power and now for all the even case so now we're going to have another sum i should probably choose a new index right here let's choose j just so we don't get confused so we have j now let's go with i so i going from one to infinity and now in order to get all the even case we need two i right here so we're going to have two i but the whole thing raised to the s power and for the i's element of the natural numbers the inside of this bracket right here will always be even. So you see we've kind of decomposed this sum right here into the odd half and the even half. And now we're going to do the same thing for our eta function. So if we do the same decomposition, we're going to get j going from 1 to infinity of 1 over 2j minus 1 to the s. But notice we also have this alternating part to deal with. So whenever our k is odd, if we have an odd number minus 1, this exponent right here will be even, and negative 1 to any even number is just 1. So for all the odd k's or odd terms, this alternating term right here will be 1. So we're just going to have 1 right here. So we can add it with the even terms now. So we're going to go from i equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 2i to the s. So that's all the even terms, 2i. And what happens if our k is even? Well, if you have even minus 1, that's going to be odd. Negative 1 to the odd is always negative 1. So, in fact, we're going to get a negative 1 right here, and we can move that out to the front. So, we're going to be subtracting this whole entire sum right here. So, now we've successfully decomposed our two sums right here into four other new sums. And um, we actually have pairs of them that look very much alike. Because notice this whole entire sum right here is the exact same thing as this whole entire sum. And this sum right here is the exact same as this sum with the exception of this negative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be subtracting the bottom row from the top row. And if we do that, 
this sum and this sum will cancel each other out. So we're gonna get zero. And if I take this sum minus the negative of the same thing, well, we're just gonna have this sum plus this sum, which is of course twice that sum. So we're going to have plus two times the sum running from i equals one to infinity of one over two i to the s like so. And let's just change the index so we're back to k. So that's the right hand side right here, but how about the left hand side? We'll just cut it off right here. What exactly is this expression equal to? Well, that's equal to zeta minus eta. So we have zeta of s minus eta of s being equal to this thing right here. And let's actually simplify this sum a little bit because notice we can distribute this x right here into this product. So we have two to the s times k to the s and two to the s is just a constant. So we can bring that out to the outside. So we have this is now two over two to the s times the sum running from k equals one to infinity of one over k to the s. And um, this sum right here looks very familiar because notice this sum right here, well, that's exactly our zeta from the very start. So this is exactly equal to two over two to the s. And I'm actually gonna simplify that down a little bit because notice this is two raised to the first power. We have the same base right here. So we can muck around with the exponent a little bit. We're gonna have one minus s in the exponent and then zeta of s. And this thing right here is equal to zeta minus eta. So what exactly did we just find right here? We found that if we take our zeta function and we subtract off the eta function, we're going to be left with two to the one minus s times zeta of s. And so remember we wanted to get some kind of new expression for our zeta of s. So let's try to isolate that a little bit. Let's subtract this term from both sides and add eta of s on both sides. And if we do that, well, we're going to get a common factor of zeta, which we can factor out. So we're going to have zeta of s, and then we're going to have one of those minus two to the one minus s. And that's going to be equal to, well, if we move eta over to this side, we're going to get eta of s like so. And finally, to isolate our zeta, we just need to divide by this thing right here. So zeta of s is now equal to one over one minus two to the one minus s times eta of s. And um, we are pretty much done. We have redefined our zeta function in terms of the eta function. And this is really quite nice because remember I said from the very start that our eta function converges for the real part of s in greater than zero. So now since we have this definition of our zeta function, we can say that this function converges for the real part of s being greater than zero. And if you remember some of the properties of the zeta function, you'll notice that this function doesn't actually converge for the real part of s greater than zero everywhere. It still has a pole at s equals to one. Because remember at the start I said that zeta of one, that's gonna give you the harmonic series. I'll just write like this, h infinity. And this thing diverges. And same situation with this definition right here. If you plug one into here, we're gonna get two to the one minus one, which is zero. And well, two to the zero is exactly one. And if you have one minus one, that's going to be zero. So when S is equal to one, you're dividing by zero. So you're getting a pole there. And if I'm not mistaken, this should be a pole of order one with a residue of one, if I remember correctly. So yeah, this thing right here, this new definition converges for a real part of S greater than zero, except for at one. And in fact, if you analytically continue the zeta function to the whole complex plane, then one is still the only pole of this function. So yeah, let's just end on that. Hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see everyone next time.